Good Monday morning, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control Rocky Top Rewind VolQuest podcast with Austin Price, Jesse Simonton, and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this Monday. Remember, check out our friends at Blue Water Climate Control online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com, or you can check them out on Twitter at blue h2o underscore climate today looking at one of tennessee fans most favorite game it's the closest game to a playoff game that i've ever covered and that's tennessee florida 2001 the volunteers um in a game that was supposed to happen in september for tennessee's sake it was they were fortunate that or lucky i guess from a football standpoint that it didn't happen it was a tragedy because of 9 11 as to why the game was not played but tennessee played uh, with Dante Stallworth and John Henderson, who they would not have had had they played in September. And Tennessee goes to Florida and uh, pulls off the upset, shocking win that, that nobody really saw coming. Everybody picked Tennessee to lose. Before we get into the details of the game, Rob, I'm going to start with you. Just in a rewatch, overall impression of this game. Uh, Tennessee's defensive front, the, just dominant. That, that's the first thing that, that jumps out to me. I don't, I don't think – as far back as I can remember, you know, going when they started playing this game yearly, I don't remember Tennessee dominating Florida in line of scrimmage like they did that day. And yeah, Ernest Graham being out, you know, played play the Tennessee's favor, but it was incredible. I know the one stat they flashed in the CBS rebroadcast late in the game. I mean, not only were they stuffing the run, but what Palmer had dropped, or excuse me, um, Rex. What's, Rex Grossman had dropped back what 35 times, I think, and then pressured 28 of them at, at one point late in the second half. I mean, it was it it, it was jarring to, to you know go back and realize you know, how 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 hard John Henderson was to handle. But you know, Outland Trophy winner it makes sense. You know, Will Overstreet making plays, Richard Moore. You forget you know how how solid he was. Just that's that's what jumped out to me. Don't forget yeah. corner 36 in there at the end of the game. Buck Fitzgerald. I mean, you know, it's, was it a hold? Was it a hold? Buck <laughs> says no. <laughs> of course he does. NPA for life. Jesse, tell, thought, how, about Bobby, okay. how about Bobby Graham being a bigger factor than, than Kelly Washington in, in this game? Well, I think that was because of how Florida elected to play it. And, and again, give Tennessee credit, Jesse, for the fact that um, they didn't force it, you know, to, to Stallworth and Washington early in that game to let Bobby Graham be a factor. And then, we're going to talk to Travis Stevens a little bit later. We'll talk to, Ke- to Casey Clawson, too, about this game. But we'll, we'll talk to um, Travis Stevens uh, in this podcast as well, who had, a, who had an unbelievable night. But Florida, Jesse, it looked like we're so scared of Tennessee on the outside. They, they did not crowd the box to stop the run, which opened up room for Travis Stevens. And it opened up the middle of the football field as well for a guy like Bobby Graham in the slot. Oh, I mean, so – I was I, I was in Gainesville at this point. Um, had moved from Georgia down to Gainesville. Been there for several years. I remember, uh, you know, not not a Florida fan, not a Tennessee fan, but these games in the unusual circumstance. I lived about a mile from campus. My dad and I walked down and kind of watched game day, uh, you know, live. We were not in the mosh pit, but just kind of walking around and, and seeing uh, the stuff. Went to went to a tailgate and just had some fun. Um, and I remember. It's funny because I re- this is a game that I remember, even though I didn't remember some of the, the, the hits of the game, because Florida fans still talk about the what-ifs and the missed opportunity of this game um, because Spurrier is convinced and still is to this day that this was one of the best teams he ever had, and it is loaded with NFL talent, especially on offense. Um, and he, you know, heads to the NFL shortly thereafter. And so, you know, this is also the famed game now covering Tennessee that you know that this is the Philip Fulmer pregame speech that's been passed around. You know, they date the same girls that you date. And they, you know, put on their uniform the same way you put on your uniform. Uh, but the difference in the game, other than Travis Stevens just being incredible, running basically the same inside zone play 25 times and just showing his nimbleness there was that – to Rob's point, yes, the defensive line, and yet Grossman was still throwing seed after seed after seed, and yet Tennessee's ability to basically halt drives in the red zone, that won them the game. That won them the game. Florida kept having to kick field goals, uh, and that ended up being the difference in, you know, what was a monumental 17-point touchdown. And, and it's funny now, moving to Tennessee, I will just say, you know, 
gotten to know Jabari Davis a little bit, Troy Fleming, obviously Buck. You know, there's a lot of guys uh, in this game that are now kind of, you know, around the program or kind of on the periphery uh, here. So that, that was kind of a funny deal on the rewatch as well for me. Man, what about I – didn't, I did not recall this, over, but how, how bad Phil had been roasted uh, if they tie, if Florida ties that game up for going for two there. Black Coach was killing them in the moment, correct? Uh, yeah, no, I, I'd forgotten that. I mean, at, at least, you know, how, how that ended up looming so large. But, boy, that would have been incredibly controversial. Well, nobody at the time really under, like, understood the chart. Like, what, what were they thinking and what was the – you know, kind of what, what was even the rationale to, to go there? I, I forgot – I mean, I remember the game just from the intensity – and the ma- and the magnitude of it. I mean, it, it was a playoff type game. It felt the closest I've felt to that in a sporting event covering it the last few years. Rob was Tennessee, Kentucky at the SEC basketball tournament on that Saturday, where everybody walked out of there and said that felt like a regional championship, or that felt like a you know a national championship caliber basketball game. This felt like what a playoff game w- would feel like, or what the SEC championship game would feel like if the two true best teams lined up and played uh, in it. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way with the division. So I remembered the intensity of the game, but upon rewatch, Austin, I didn't remember, you know, Tennessee comes out of the gate, unbelievable first drive. I mean, just, you know, scripted out or whatever. I mean, when according to plan, Tennessee gets the big lead and then they get the turnover bug. Witten has two bad turnovers in this game. And all of a sudden here's Florida back in the game when it looks like out of the gate, Tennessee shocks them and may have a chance to run them out of the barn, and they didn't. Yeah, I, I thought that this game, uh, really that whole 0 one season, I get, get it. I mean, you got some real studs out there. I mean, look at the receivers. Look at Travis Stevens, Casey's in sophomore year at this point uh, and hitting his stride. But I thought this was a – this game, this season, was a perfect uh, resume uh, for Randy Sanders, who, you know, I think probably did not get the credit that he probably deserved here because everybody had such an affinity and an affection for David Cutcliffe. Um, you know, but, you know, this this game, Tennessee came out of the, the, the blocks in a hurry. Um, I, I thought they were motivated. And, and I think, you know, Tennessee's always been better in all sports, and in just football, when they're the underdog. They were the underdog in this game. Everybody predicted Florida was going to win this game. All the pundits said Florida were going to win this game. And, and so I think that this team really had a core group of guys, whether it be John Henderson or, or Casey Clawson um, on either side of the ball as leaders um, that, I, that I think really kind of rallied the troops, uh, so to speak, in this game and got everybody super fired up to get off to a quick start, and they did. Y- y'all, will have, y'all obviously know the history because you've seen every single one of these games uh covering them and, and and whatnot that has to be one of the worst games Jason Witten ever played in Tennessee I mean because he even got put on his back a couple of times in run blocking situations uh I, I counted and this was just casual it wasn't like I was charting the game they flexed him out at least five times and three of those plays ended in two of them ended in disaster the interception of fumble and a third one He just doesn't make a physical play that should have been a touchdown on a pretty well-thrown fade pattern, gets incomplete. Tennessee misses the field goal the next play. You know, it it costs Tennessee points there. I just, you know, for a guy that had such a prolific college career and then obviously went on and had a long-time NFL career, rewatching it, that was certainly had to be one of the the worst days of his career at, at Tennessee. Yeah, I made a note of it right here. I was going to bring that up. That you go, I mean, there was tons of talent. On, the, on this field, tons. And the guy who, you know, he's going to be the a first ballot Hall of Famer probably, you know, went on to have the better pro, pro career than anybody on here. Was a, he was worse than a non-factor. I mean, gift wrapped at Florida, what, 10, 14 points. Yeah. He was, it is ironic. I mean, obviously, you know, Jason, you know, it was, as Jesse said, probably the worst day of his career. But I, I just thought, I mean, he was, in hindsight, looking back, probably the best football player in terms of the scope of his career on the field that day. And, you know, to have it, have it go like it did for him is just kind of funny. Well, and again, I, I mean, I think because of the way Florida and Tennessee anticipated Florida defending them, they had they were going to use Jason in a lot of ways. And I probably got away from some of that stuff just because he was struggling as, as bad as he did in, in that game. Uh, so it's back to Austin's point about being an underdog. It's the only game that when we do a picks, you know, we do our, our, our game picks, 
It's the only time I've had parents and current players reach out to me because I picked Florida to win the game instead of Tennessee. That's how locked in and dialed in Tennessee was. I mean, they were there were some parents of players and some some players who were they were convinced they were going to win, and they were bothered by the fact that that I picked Florida, who by the way was a two touchdown favorite, uh, two touchdown seventeen points, yeah. yeah, to win this game. Uh, but that's that's the kind of the intensity going into the game and kind of the week uh, and the build up to the game that Tennessee had. I, I'll and, start, oh, go ahead, Jesse. Just a quick note on the underdog thing. I mean, it makes sense when you look at both of their seasons as a whole up to that point. Now, again, Tennessee won the game. They made more plays. But Florida, to that point, I mean, it, it, was, in a, it was in a story I found. They were – in their six SEC wins, they were winning those games by almost 40 points, an average of 40 points. Tennessee's same margin in their six wins by, was an average of 12.8 points. I mean, that's a pretty big disparity, and yet Tennessee had enough talent – and, and Travis Henry was just beastly, or Travis Stevens, excuse me, was just beastly, and that, you know, proved to be the difference. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you this, too, and I'm not going to pick on any – I'm not picking on him. Todd Johnson was ready to, ready to not see Tennessee anymore. The year before, Tennessee had – Tennessee got beat, but Travis Henry took Todd Johnson to school physically all day long. I mean, he ran over him. I mean, he drug Todd Johnson until Todd Johnson finally would trip him up and get him to the ground. And then in this game, Johnson never got his hands on, on Travis Stevens. And, he, and if he did, Stevens stiff-armed him or whatever. Um, Tennessee, Tennessee really felt like they had a huge advantage against Johnson at the safety position and tried to attack him both years. It worked in 01 for a win. It worked in 2000, but it wasn't enough for Tennessee to get a win. This is also the game of the famed introduction of the Prowler package on defense, which drew all this acclaim. Mike Griffin had like 14 breakdown stories on the Prowler package because he absolutely loved it. But this is the first time we see the Outland Trophy winner, John Henderson, standing up, moving around. It was an old scheme that John Chavis pulled out from his Alabama A&M days and brought it in that Tennessee had not introduced or shown. And it obviously paid dividends because Florida's offensive line had a hard time figuring out where Tennessee's defensive front was coming from. That and Chief, I mean, he brought some heat in this game too. I mean, he was not afraid, uh, you know, to, to leave leave guys in one-on-one situation. And, and and as Jesse mentioned, Grossman, you know, made him pay for it a lot. What do you end up throwing for about three fifty in this Just game? Over, yeah. Well, he and he and and the they've seen ten, chief seemed to be okay with giving up that little dump off pass to Robert Gillespie. You know, he might've caught 10 some odd passes in this game where, you know, it was a cat blitz and, and Robert would go out and Rex would just kind of dump it to him, but you know, it didn't amount to massive yardage. And so it was limiting the touches, although they still had a lot of catches for Gaffney and Caldwell and those guys who you're talking about at that point, they, those guys are all American receivers, which might, makes the play that Buck made at the end of the game, considering he, you know, did not have a ton of experience, you know, all the more impressive. Yeah, Tennessee, again, it goes down, it goes back to making plays. I think the other narrative coming out of this was, was Tennessee's lack of intimidation factor. Uh, I mean, Tennessee, Austin was as loose as a goose in this game. I mean, it, it was, as, as Rob said, Chief was coming from everywhere. Randy Sanders is aggressive. They go for it on fourth down on a little bootleg with, with Casey Clawson. Um, Casey played like it was just in typical Casey fashion, just another ball game. And I think for Tennessee to win down there, which they had struggled to do, that's what had to happen. And so I think Casey probably doesn't get the credit he deserves in this game for directing an offense that played, I don't want to say with a I don't care attitude, but they certainly played with zero intimidation uh, factor and, and certainly played with a ton of confidence, which is what he was all about. I mean, he thrived in those situations in his career. Oh, 100%. I mean, he just exuded confidence. It wasn't a cockiness. I mean, everybody wanted to call him California, California cool, and he had the spiked hair and all that. He just was confident. I mean, you know, he was not intimidated by anybody or any situation. So going into the swamp, knowing Tennessee had not won there in 30 years at that point in time, even though that's kind of misleading because Tennessee had only played there, you know, a you know, handful of times. It wasn't like they played there every other year for 30 years. But um, at the same time, he, they just 
you know, exuded confidence. And I think that that just I matriculated onto his teammates. I mean, you know, and then what was it? Was it what's I forget the first name, Scott, the safety from Florida. Um, was it Gus Scott, Tony Scott? Gus Scott, I think, yeah. Yeah, Gus Scott. I, he, Travis Stevens, just, I mean, him just bouncing off Travis Stevens on that run in the second half was just, to me, th- 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 that was as, as defining a moment in that little five or six year run after 98, as we saw. I did, I did think, you know, rewatching this game, or I, I thought one of the most underrated plays was uh, because, you know, you, because I did think it was, was key that Tennessee got to play with the lead throughout you know they were even as at times they were holding on they got to, it's 23 21 Florida has the ball just outside field goal range um you know we're late in the third quarter here fourth and six they decide not to kick a field goal Overstreet comes up with a big sack Tennessee's coverage on the back end is finally good um you know if Florida takes the lead there it, how does Tennessee respond their defense responded so that it wasn't a problem they go down and score I, I just thought that was Rewatching it, taking those, that was a big, that was kind of a big play in the game there. The most was, boggling thing to me, Brent, was the fact that, that Travis Stevens had 226 yards on 19 carries. I mean, you know, oh, you know yeah. earlier in the year, they get, they, you know, they did not, you know, they gave it to him, what, 40 something times against Arkansas? I mean, think about it, if he had gotten that amount of touches in, in Gainesville. Well, well, then they think, couldn't, well, then they couldn't get the, I mean, the other thing is they couldn't. They were running the ball down Florida State, but then they couldn't get a first down at the end after after they had already gotten a stop against uh, the Gators. They get the stop, but then they can't they can't they have a chance to ice the game, and they couldn't do it. I wanted to circle back to your point about you know confidence not being intimidated. I thought that showed up in the composure as well. I don't know what the overall penalties were. I, I, I had I looked at the box score, but I can't remember now. But um, in terms of penalties, how I mean Florida lines up to go for it twice on fourth and one. And have offensive linemen jump off sides to you know to just you know kill that scenario. And Tennessee, I mean, they avoided that kind of stuff. I mean, they had some turnovers, whatever, but they didn't have the breakdowns like that 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 cost them in that game. I thought it was really clean, and I think that is a reflection of what you're talking about with the confidence they played with. I thought that showed up in their execution. Well, and I think that opening drive was just so pivotal for Tennessee to take the ball and go the length of the field and score a touchdown. Really planted a flag that said, hey. We're, we're here to play today. Um, you know, coaches always say the first five minutes of a game or first five minutes of a half is such an important part. I, I think from, from, a, from a settling in and from a confident standpoint, Tennessee's ability to go down the field and score uh, the way they did on that opening drive uh, was, was paramount in that game. And then in the second half, you know, Tennessee made some adjustments to be able to get Washington installed with the ball, particularly in the third quarter which they could not do uh, in, in the first half. And that seemed to open up the run lanes again. Jesse, you're right. They couldn't put it away when Tennessee crammed it in there tight and said, hey, we're going to line up and run it. And, and, and I think part of that was because that's not what had, had them so much running success. They would almost spread them out a little bit, and they were so worried about, you know, the outside throws that it softened up the middle of the field. And at that point in time, Nobody in the stands believed that Tennessee was going to put the ball in the air, so that allowed Florida to actually pack the box for the first time the entire game. I mean, you watch the replay, there's not a lot of eight-man boxes Tennessee's running against in that game because they were so afraid of, of Stallworth and Washington in that game. That's a good point, yep. That, that paid huge dividends. Well, this, obviously, we know what happened the next week. We won't talk about that oh. game with Tennessee fans. It, it was ugly, but that was certainly a night in Gainesville uh, one to remember, Philip Fulmer saying afterwards, Spurrier's comment to him afterwards, Rob, was, hey, congratulations, you kicked, you kicked our rear ends. Um, yeah, that, just, that was his before comment. Before we, before we wrap this up, we're almost 30 minutes in. I'm incredulous. Nobody's going to mention Eddie Moore decapitating guy, <laughs> Kelvin Kite. My God, we've, we've talked about how the, you know, some of these hits we've seen in, on these rewatches would have been you know, flags, ejections. Eddie Moore is, is at the top of the list for that for that shot. I mean, that was good gracious. Well, and I'm not sure John Henderson would have finished that game either with a couple of the hits that he had on Rex what, Roseman. Were any of y'all there post game when Hainsworth says it's the swamp, I guess, but we've made it into a little old pond today. That's a pretty, that's a pretty classic quote. Oh, Tennessee was, Tennessee was feeling, Tennessee was feeling good about themselves. They had, they had plenty of, of positive or plenty of good quotes at the end. And Spurrier was gracious, you know, in defeat. I just remember he came out and said, I've always told you guys, 
you know, when you don't win in this game kicking field goals, we beat them a lot of times kicking by, by forcing them to field goals. Tonight they made us kick field goals as a difference in the football game. And this really, this really was kind of a changing of the guard, like a la- the last kind of – I mean, there's been other storied Tennessee-Florida games, but – this you know, was his looked, last game. This was his last one. Um, you know, it, 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 these two teams had dominated this the East for this decade. It was Fulmer versus Spurrier. Um, and then the next year, Georgia becomes in the mix and becomes kind of a three-team deal for the next, you know, five, six years. And, and so this, this kind of was kind of almost, you know, it was like you said at the beginning, Hubs, it was, a, it was legitimately a playoff game. But it was also kind of the, uh, the coronation of what had been kind of an incredible decade between these two teams because of it was kind of a changing of the guard thereafter. Yeah, and as, as we get out the door here, the other thing is I remember Tennessee fans talking about, see, this is why you should play Florida. This game should be played at the end of the year. Um, you know, instead, you know, Florida played Florida State, so they, they couldn't play this game at the end of the year. But for so many years, the two best teams in the SEC, not in the East, but in the SEC for a decade, were the two teams that met in December and what would have been the date for the SEC championship game. And I remember Tennessee fans clamoring, hey, you see what happens when you, you want your two best, you know, your best matchup, your two best teams playing at the end of the year. And, and obviously it was a, a huge win for Tennessee. And, you know, we all know about Tennessee coming back to Knoxville and circling around the track and having roses and all those things. We know that backfired on them a week later. But for that night, you know, for that moment, that was uh, one Tennessee fans will never forget um, and, and was a huge night for Philip Fulmer and his program. Hey, in East Tennessee, you need a reliable heating and air system designed for your home and our climate. You need a team that's trained and held to the highest of standards. You need solutions, not sales pitches. There are many heating and air companies in East Tennessee. There's only one name you need to know. That's Blue Water Climate Control, family operated, veteran owned, when you need a new system or a major repair, Blue Water isn't going to send out a salesman. They're going to send out an re- uh, air conditioning expert who's going to give you a layout of your options, which include everything from repairing the system you have, replacing it with a system that is affordable. Whatever you need, they can handle it for you. They have financing, including same as cash, even rent to own. Call them at 865-299-2290 or visit them at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com to make an appointment. Blue Water is an authorized dealer for American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning. Coming up next, Travis Stevens and Casey Clawson. Remember the 2001 Florida game. Happy to welcome to the Rocky Top Rewind Podcast Edition. Travis Stevens joins us talking about that magical night in Gainesville, Florida in 2001. Uh, Travis, we thank you for joining us on the podcast. How you been doing, my man? Nah, I'm doing fine, doing fine. Like I said, I've been quarantined and just hanging out at the house mostly. Been spending, what, 95% of my time at the house and maybe going to, you know, Walmart every now and then. But other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> like, like everybody else. I, how many times a week, a month, do you get asked about the O one one game when you're out and about? How often do people ask you about that Florida game? Yeah, about 99% of the time, that's what, the, you know, it's a, it's a big memory because it was a historic, a historic game, historic moment. And, of course, that time was a historic. So, yes, it was just, yeah, but I say about 99% of the time, that's, the, that's the, the game that I've been asked about. You know, I get a couple other games, but that one, of course, that was uh, monumental. Hey, Travis, everybody remembers that game, um, one, because of, the fact that it was delayed till December because of uh, the tragedy of September 11th, too, because winning uh, in at the swamp for the first time since the 70s. Um, just take me about take me take take us all through just that week. You know, when when the game got postponed and you were playing it, the you know the final game of the year instead of playing Kentucky or Vanderbilt. Take me through you know preparations that week because realistically you you know you're playing for a, a chance to go to Atlanta. Right. Well, like you said, it was postponed to the end. So, like I said, the, all the the marbles on the table. Like you know, it was a, a game that, that that was going to determine who was going to go to the course the the East the East Championship in the uh, SEC. So it was just it was intense. You know, you know, it was a lot of pressure, of course, because of Florida, who they were, they were number two in the nation prior to that. Uh, you know, that week. Um, you know, they were putting up a lot of points. That was probably one of Florida's. Uh, I will say greatest teams in their history. So, uh, but uh, 
we felt, you know, we felt a little bit disrespected because of the the, the point spread as far as the, us being like a 20 point plus underdogs or whatever, uh, with us being having the same record. But uh, we could understand, I guess, really, uh, given the history, that, that that's probably why that happened. And also uh, who Florida was and, and for us for not beating them down there in 30 years, uh, that, you know, I guess that was – that made that, you know, made that, that point spread or whatever. I don't know, but um, it was really in, intense. We, were dis, we felt disrespected, so we came in there ready. We, you know, coming in as underdogs, we, we felt that uh, we had just an equal amount of chance uh, of, of winning the game as, as they did because of, you know, who, you know, who we were. So uh, that's about it. You guys got off to such a great start in that game, Travis, and jumped out to the big lead and then, some bad things happened with some turnovers, and all of a sudden the game sort of shifted back. Uh, you know, at the half, it was pretty much e evened up. But what do you remember maybe at the halftime of, of that game? Because, like I said, you got scored on the opening possession. You jumped out to a double-digit lead, gave it back in the second quarter. What, what was halftime like there before you, really got, you guys really offensively dominated in the second half? Yeah, I mean, really wasn't even out of the game. Like I said, we didn't start it off, but they, you know, they had you know that momentum switch where they, you know, they made some big plays. I think uh, they got a turnover, uh, interception, or whatever, and uh, maybe another turnover, or whatever. But it was just uh, we were still in the game. You know, it wasn't like it was because I think at halftime it was twenty. We're da we're down to, it was fourteen or twenty, I believe. But uh, um, we just, you know, had to keep our focus. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't lose focus just because of being down. So we wanted to make sure we came out. I think we got the ball coming into the second half, I believe, and scored right away. Uh, you know, went down and scored right away. So uh, that's where, you know, that momentum we still had. You know, we still that momentum swing back then, right then. I think we kept the lead after that, I believe. So um, it was just, you know, we knew we weren't out of the game, and so. Uh, you never give up, man. You know, I always wanted to put myself in us. I would always want to be in a situation like that where I had, you know, the uh, influence uh, in, in a game, a big game like that. So, and I knew, like I said, uh, the, the team was still in tune. Nobody was down. You know, everybody was still motivated. Why, why were you so good that night? Because, I mean, look, I, I know your offensive line played well, and I know you're going to give them credit because I know who you are. But, I mean, you, you made safeties miss. You broke tackles. You outrun, you outran angles. Why were you so good that night? Only, only because I was prepared. When you come in prepared and ready and focused, that's that's the only. I mean, you know, and you get a rhythm, a zone. They say um, that's the only reason why I didn't come in knowing that. You know, of course, I, I didn't expect to do whatever I did. I just knew I needed to be focused and ready and uh, and prepared. So. If if you if if you got those things you know if you got those, all those things intact you know that things like that can happen where uh, where you're in a zone and everything is pretty much could could happen right for you you know what I'm saying so it it, it could have been anybody else it, it, you know very well could have been anybody else on the team but it just happened to be you know one of those big nights that I had individually as well so but everybody was focused man like everybody had a even though like. Like I said, my my <laughs> performance might have outshadowed a lot of things, but everybody played pretty well and and uh, and uh, and, and, and win the game. So let's recap: two hundred twenty-six yards on just nineteen carries and two touchdowns. H have you ever had a game where you were in that kind of zone, though? I mean, over ten yards of carry against that defense in the swamp. I mean, you know, uh, that that's that's way beyond special, like that that type of game. So, I mean, I, 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 running for three or 400 yards in, in a game in high school is one thing, but to do it on that stage, is that is that your best game ever? Yeah, on a, on a college stage, yeah, I would say that. Uh, of course, in high school, we had yeah, a, lot, a lot of people had more better games than that, but as far as stat-wise, but. Yeah, that was uh, I think it was at nine with the average nine yards of carry or something like that. But now I wouldn't expect it to have a big game like that. But that was the biggest game as far as uh, stat wise. You know, I had uh, you know some other big games during that season with you know other you know other uh, teams, of course, but uh, against other teams. But yeah, that was yeah that that I didn't like I said I didn't expect to do it like that and be <laughs> that wasn't planned. Like I said, all I was doing was being focused coming into that game. And I was just hoping I would do every, anything and everything that I could to get this team a victory, you know. Let's, 
let's flip it and rewind and go all the way back to freshman year. So you go, you come in with Travis Henry, obviously Jamal. Right. Each one of you three have something kind of special. Jamal's got the freshman rushing record at what thirteen sixty four. Right. Travis Henry's got the all time rushing record, and then you have the single season rushing record. Um, or no, you're just thirteen sixty four. Um, you know, just talk about. I mean, when you look back now, you just kind of realize, man, I mean, we had a special room. Yes. I mean, like there have been rooms. I mean, you know, Aaron Hayden and Little Man and and, right. and Charlie Garner and those guys had a really special room, but you all had a special room too. And then when when you got to 01 and, and you were the man, those guys were gone. You know, yeah. how much did you really kind of feel that, okay, it's my time. I mean, you look at some of the runs, not only on this night against Florida, the screen pass against Georgia, obviously no one talks about that because what happened in the last 30 seconds. Right. I mean, that was as special a play as, as, as there was as far as individual effort. Right, right, right. Um, well, anyway uh... – um, you know, we always talk about, you know, we'll talk about that uh, as far as us be, coming in at the same same time. And I just felt like, if you know, if anybody uh, uh, plays in front of me, they're going to be a special guy because I know I know I was going to put in the work enough to, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, to please uh, the, the audience that, you know, just watch me. But uh, um, that was just it was my, you know, my time was it happened to be later. You know, I didn't mind waiting. I didn't mind waiting. I just needed it. I was like me and Travis always talking as well. It was like I just needed. We just needed one season just to show showcase. It didn't matter when it came. You know, as long as it came. So, and that's why people didn't understand why I did. I registered. You don't usually register after two years of you know not being registered. So, uh, I went to Coach Fulmer. Said, man, I, you know, you, you gotta, you know, you gotta get Travis and, and Jamal. You really don't need me to waste a year. So I just hope, you know, let, let me stay back because if I didn't, if he wouldn't have let me redshirt, I would have had to leave, you know, because I wouldn't have had that year uh, in 01. So uh, he went ahead and granted the wishes. And then, like I said, uh, the, you know, it happened to happen that way where the 01, um, I was able to prepare myself, not just, you know, people think I just, uh, <laughs> I guess they didn't understand it, but it gave me a whole off season to prepare because I knew, I was going to be the man uh, next in line. So uh, uh, I did a lot of work, you know, prior to that season as far as, you know, working out and extra work, getting up early in the morning, just by myself doing things alone, and then also uh, doing the things with the team. So when you do that, of course, that allow you to set, you know, set records, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure, you know, Jamal, he he came in working out and he was already, <laughs> I would think he was already NFL ready because of his size and speed and stuff. So uh, um, he, you know, he did everything he needed to do to, to, to be ready. And then of course, Travis Henry uh, coming out of Frostproof, being one of the top uh, running backs and Mr. Florida um, um, coming in uh, out, out of, uh, out of Florida anyway. So, I just believe that, uh, you know, the, the moments came at the right times, even though we thought, you know, at one point, like, hey, man, how can three running backs are – actually, you know, they recruited five of us coming in. So, we was just trying to see how it would work out, but it ended up working out. So, uh, Travis, thing. Would, you, would you look back on – for me, when I look back on that season – the thing that that jumps out to me is is a game nobody talks about. It's that Arkansas rain game, because that was the night to me you showed the durability that some people wondered, because you weren't the heavy like Travis Henry was. You weren't a heavy body like Jamal Lewis was. So could could this smaller guy um, handle you know twenty five, twenty eight carries? What ended up being nearly I guess thirty five or forty carries that night. How right. much do you think you proved yourself to your teammates, to the coaching staff that, hey, you can lean on me. I, I can carry the load for four quarters for an entire season. Yeah, I just felt like, and I, I keep saying this, I was like, how, you give me a chance to mess that up first. Like, give me a chance to, you know, they never even gave me a chance to even do that. Like, how can people give, uh, you know, say something about somebody just because of their size, you know, because – I've never had a chance to do that. You know, I really never had a chance to do that. You know, with being with uh, all of us there together, it's kind of, it's almost a, little, it's a lot more pressure because you don't have many carries to prove yourself. But I, I was ready, you know, I was ready to come in there because I told you I prepared prior to the season. 
And no, I didn't, I didn't listen to nobody else because all I had was me to work out, and, you know, in, in, in as far as focus on me, making sure I was ready. So it didn't matter what, you know, uh, if I was going to get, a, you know, 20 times, 40 times or whatever, my, you know, I prepared myself physically to do, you know, to do whatever, you know, so um, uh, that, you know, in that game right there, you know, I guess God just showed all those naysayers that, you know, well, this man, you know, he, he can do it. <laughs> Let me go back to the two, to the 2001 Florida game. Can you put into words what that locker room was like afterwards? Oh, man, it was just after the game, of course, excited. With You know, it was like a, a relief thing, and, you know. Um, uh, I guess I hate losing, you know, and a lot of, a lot of guys hate losing. So, but, uh, like, it was just, a, you know, a big relief. Everybody was, of course, joyous, you know, tears were shed. Too. I know I was crying after the game. I was crying before the game and after the game because – it was just a big moment, you know. It's an emotional moment for us. So, uh, you know, everything was on the line. So, like I said, I just knew I wanted to give my all, and if I, I can, I can be satisfied if I gave my all, and like we, if we won or lost, as long as I knew that I, have, I was prepared and ready and gave my all. So, but uh, uh, with, with that, you know, after a game and you win and been victorious, it becomes emotional as well as exciting. All right, so after the game, y'all come back. You go to Tom Black track. Casey's got roses in his mouth and all that good stuff. If you could go back in time, would you would you go back in time and change anything that led into Atlanta, or would you go back in time and step out at the three yard line against Georgia and kick the field goal and win the game instead of you scoring? You scored, which was phenomenal. Yeah. But if you go out right. and kick the field goal and the game's over. Yeah. You asked if I go back and change Atlanta, I change uh, Georgia. Which one? If if you could go back and, and <laughs> both. <laughs> I mean, I would both, but I mean, if if I had to pick one, of course, it'll be in uh, Atlanta, Atlanta because Georgia doesn't, you know, that's absolutely doesn't mean anything because you know it would just been a loss because we made up for it, you know. So, yep. but yeah, it would definitely been it would have been um, LSU. Um, because you know that you know that would have put us in the Rose Bowl, Travis. And I don't I don't want to dwell on that week because that's a week nobody really wants to remember. But when you do reflect on that week going to the SEC championship game, was that just a night where you guys didn't play well, or was it truly everybody was assuming Rose Bowl because you had beat LSU before and you guys weren't as focused as you needed to be for that game? How do you? Thinking back on it 20 years later, nearly 20 years later, how, how do you recall that, that week leading up to it? Uh, well, I mean, it, it probably, you know, being that we already had beat LSU that, that uh, early that year, um, uh, I, I would, I don't know, I, I would say the focus wasn't as, as strong as, you know, uh, as that, that Florida game or whatever, or, or just, you know, just knowing that we beat them already, we just, you know, of course, it was just something that we thought maybe we had a, in, 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 the, in the books. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Like I said, it, it had to have been the focus, man. <laughs> it, it, it was tough. It was a tough situation right there. It was tough. That was a tough loss. That was a real tough loss. So, for those that haven't seen Travis since he finished his playing career, Travis, we're, you know, we're, we're basically 20 years removed from your senior year. Travis, you look like you could still play. <laughs> Looking and feeling is totally different, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can work out and fake it, like like I look like a play. I can tell somebody making me lie. I don't lie, but I can lie and hey, man, yeah, I can say, but nah. But you know, it's just boy, like twenty years uh, of, of football years removed is like I guess two hundred dog years. Like now they say dog years. <laughs> I am broke down. My shoulder hurts now. You know, so but yeah, no, nah, no football years. They 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 go quick, just like dog years. <laughs> all right, all right. As as we wrap it up, I have to. I do want to ask you this: What is your favorite play? Your favorite run from that Florida game? Do you have one? Is there is there a highlight that you go, or is there a run from that season? I remember you had a jump cut at Alabama that was yeah. Was jump cut for that. Is there a run where you go? That's my run. That's my signature. I mean, there's a lot of runs, and I, I, I don't know. I couldn't say that. Um, 
from each game, I can pick you like, see, yeah, of course, Alabama, that one, Georgia, the last one, because that would have been, that was, oh, but that run right there would have been, like, you always want to be the hero at the end, and you went the game winning touchdown. That would have been, that would have been good if big we uh, won the game. But, uh, um, you know, what, we had. A, what about Florida then? Yeah, Florida had several runs. I guess the, the probably the biggest one at the end, you know, when we were, um, you know, Florida, off of you. Yeah, you know how Florida, you know how loud Florida is because, you know, I always thought, I don't know if, I, if you heard, uh, well, I, I said this from my freshman year, you know, when we did, went down in Florida and that crowd has to be the loudest crowd ever in the history of football. I don't, I don't know how to say the history, but I've known that was the loudest crowd I've ever uh, been a part of, you know, in, you know, with the stadiums that I visited. And, uh, to have that moment, I thought about that moment back there when I was a freshman. Like, if I had the opportunity to come in this game and play, I would be ready. Just like I said, I would be focused and you know prepared or whatever. Because I felt like when we went down there in my freshman year, a lot of guys were nervous, and you know it's one thing to be nervous, but to play nervous, you can't play nervous in games like that. You just you got to be ready in big games. You got to be ready, you know. Usually. So, but that, um, and let's say, like, I want to, I got to go back to that, that uh, LSU game. LSU saw that I ran for, for, you know, that many yards against Florida. They wasn't going to let me, you know, Nick Saban, they weren't going to let me do, you know, they was going to prepare to shut me down. And uh, they were going to get, you know, hey, decide to get beat somewhere else, what, you know, somewhere else, like maybe in the past game, but I don't, you know, uh, anyway, they, they were prepared for me. But, uh, that game, I'll say that that last run, that big run against, uh, you know, the big run, the 70, I guess it was 70 yards, whatever, 71 yards uh, against Florida would be, you know, probably the biggest, biggest runs of that game. But, you know, of course, I had like the three other uh, big runs. Uh, but uh, that's, that's I would I would pick that last run as far as, you know, the biggest one on that game uh, in Florida. Well, you, you had a ton of special runs in that season and had a, a terrific season. Uh, your patience uh, has something young people today should take note of uh, to wait your turn and then to seize the opportunity the way that you did is really incredible. Travis, it's great to catch up with you. Appreciate you joining us. Thanks for spending some time with us on the Rocky Top Rewind edition of the Blue Water Climate Control BallQuest.com podcast. We appreciate right. it, my man. I appreciate you having me. Go balls. Welcome back to the Rocky Top Rewind Blue Water Climate Control BallQuest.com podcast with Austin Price. Joined by Casey Clawson talking about the 2001 Florida game, an epic win for Tennessee in the Swamp, 34 to 32. Casey was 17 of 25 for 168 yards in that game. Give me just 20 years, whatever it is later, give me your most vivid memory of that night in that game. Uh, I think the most probably vivid memory was uh, on defense, that fourth uh, down uh, play. I think um, you know it was a back and forth game. We came out really fast, and uh, just the guys competing. No one gave us a chance. Obviously, we were pretty excited and pumped up to go out there and compete with those guys. We were healthy at that time of the year, the end of the year. So we felt we had our best shot, our best team as as the day. And uh, best memory was that fourth down play where uh, they had an incomplete pass and went out there, took a knee, and got the big win. Casey, when you look at this game, obviously it's postponed till December because of 9-11. Um, mm-hmm. I, I always talk about Tennessee's kind of, you know, murderer's row schedule where they play Florida, Georgia, Team X from the West, and then Bama um, in, in, in kind of succession. This year, the Georgia game gets moved to November. How much did it benefit you to have that game not in September, but in December? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in the past history, pretty much whoever won that game, this is going back well before I was there, whoever won that game pretty much, uh, you know, uh, going around the table in the East. For us, for that specific year, we were banged up. You know, Big John would definitely not play. Dante busted his hand uh, the first game, so he would have been out. So um, for us to play it at the end of the year uh, at 100%, um, you know, definitely uh, you know, gave us a better opportunity that night. You know, Casey, going back and watching that game again and, and looking at it, I think everybody talks about Travis, and Travis was phenomenal that night, obviously running the football. And, and there's so much talk about Dante and Kelly and their points. Bobby Graham was like your little security blanket. He actually led the team in receiving. What 
was it where they were just so focused on Dante and Kelly outside that you just took what they gave you in the middle with Bobby? Is that what ended up happening? Yeah. Yeah. They pretty much played that entire game, um, middle field open, which means two safety look. And so we had numbers in the box all night long. They were not going to let uh, Dante or Kelly, um, you know, beat them that night and they could not cover, you know, those two guys one-on-one. So they had help over the top, which, obviously gave us numbers in the run game. And then we did throw it. You know, Bobby uh, did a great job, you know, underneath, um, finding the open holes in the zones and uh, just football. We wanted to make the game, take a little bit more shots down the field, but they just pretty much took that away from us. So obviously Travis had an unbelievable night. The offensive line, you know, pretty much controlled the game. And then uh, when we needed to throw the ball, you know, we uh, you know, made some plays uh, through the air. But, uh, yeah, we uh, had, had a fun night that night offensively. You know, Casey, it's interesting because a lot of your teammates then and even now give you credit for that team's mentality that night. Like, I remember you saying to your team that week, look, quit talking about the swamp. It's just a field to go play in. How much do you think your mm -hmm. leadership there, because you did fast, start so fast, how much do you think your leadership during the week helped everybody just to go in with the mentality of, just play the game because you're always just play the game guy. The bit, the bigger the moment, the bigger the stage, the better. How much do you think you helped your teammates settle into that game before it ever started? I think uh, that's part of, um, you know, leadership. That's part of, I think, being the quarterback. I know a lot was made of the game prior to when I got there. And um, I think the focus the entire week in practice or whether we're getting dinner with about 15, 20 of the guys, the old Charlie's on Wednesday nights, which we always did. Was, they put on their helmets just like we do. They got four-star, five-star All-Americans just like we do. So we make plays. We have um, you know some good opportunities to make uh, plays and have fun, and we'll be fine. The thing I think which was a little overhyped was just the environment, which I love that. I mean, that, that's why you go to the SEC and play in front of 96,000 yelling, screaming people, throwing everything at. Like, if you don't want that, then – go somewhere else or go play another conference. But that thing got, I think, all of us dialed in, especially a young sophomore quarterback going on the road, which, again, I think a lot of it was not just the guys around me, but more how's this young quarterback going to handle that, which, again, that's kind of what I enjoyed and thrived on. So when you go back to that game, did you sit back when you handed the ball off? Because Travis had so many big runs. Yeah. Did you step back once you handed the ball off and carried out your fake and man, you just kind of just kind of an awe at some of the runs he had because I mean he he may have been five nine maybe well, we'll give him five ten but he 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 ran like a six foot one back that night. Yeah, they could they could not tackle him and we knew going in if they're gonna play too high and take away both uh, Dante and Kelly outside that it was pretty much if we did our job up front and got a hat on a hat. It was him and a linebacker five yards apart, or it was him and a strong safety at eight yards off, and they're not going to tackle him. And as we saw, the first quarter, second quarter, we came out, kind of opened it up a little bit, and they pretty much clamped down and said, okay, enough of this. We're going to take away the pass. And um, their linebacking core, as well as their safeties, they, they just could not tackle Travis. We wanted to, if we wanted to run the ball every single play based upon how they were playing us, we could run the ball every single play, and they really had you – know, we had a hat on the hat, plus our running back with a safety or linebacker six to eight yards off. That, that was great advantage for us. Do you, do, do you look back at that game now and, and realize that you retired Spurrier at Florida? You run into the NFL? No, I, I didn't really – yeah, no, I didn't really – I never really thought about it like that. Um, obviously, I had great respect for Coach Spurrier, my youngest brother, Jimmy. Um, actually uh, you know, met with them in South Carolina. It was one of his schools that he looked at. But, um, no, I think after that game, um, I think their program obviously, you know, uh, uh, you know, changed, I think, for, for a little bit, for a couple of years. But, no, I, I haven't really thought about that. They were obviously loaded with Rex and all the receivers that they had. And, you know, defensively, they were obviously, you know, really, really good. But uh, it was an awesome, I think, not only uh, moment for the players, but I think for the fans. It had been a long long time since I think Tennessee had won down there and uh, it was a really good, uh, you know, good night and obviously a big win for us as a program.
Yeah, it, it was to, – to me, it's the mo. It was, it was a playoff game before there were playoffs because, I mean, winter was in. Correct. Yep. Uh, for you, and my final question to you, when you look back on your career, everybody talks about that game uh, as maybe your greatest moment because as a sophomore you won down there. When you look back on your career, is that your, is that your favorite game? Is that your biggest highlight? Or is there, is there another game that, that stands out to you not that you're negating the 0-1 game, but is there something else that maybe you re- refer to as one of your top moments that, um, that that's not just that Florida win? I, I think probably the the coolest moment, and not only I think on the field but off the field, I think it was probably the Michigan game because as big of a high that we had after the Florida game, um, the LSU game was obviously disappointing. And then there was kind of this, well, I don't know if you want to practice, if you want to play, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, obviously we had a big team meeting. And I was really proud of the team by bouncing back and obviously putting on that performance. Because really no matter who we played, it didn't matter. Um, we, were that, we were that good. I mean, we were a really, really good team. Um, not saying we're going to beat Miami if we would have went to the Rose Bowl. They were, they were really good too. But – we were by far one of the top two or three teams in the country that year, especially towards the end of the year, the way we were playing. So for us to have the high of the Florida game, the low of the LSU game, and then to bounce back, I think for us as a team collectively, it was probably the most proudest moment. Obviously, senior year, we had really um, – we overachieved, I believe, my senior year. We had some really good wins and some you know tough places to play. But I think the way that we as a program, as a team, kind of came together and – bounce back in that Michigan game, which again kicks off the 2002 season where we had huge expectations. And um, again, that was just a tough year overall for a lot of us. But yeah, I'd say that, that Michigan game was, was, was a fun game. Yeah, I, re- I remember, and I'll let you go with this. I, I remember <clears throat> the, the meet, bowl media day in Knoxville. The question everybody asked was, how motivated was this team to play? And you, you didn't call out your teammates because you'd already had this conversation with them, but you've made it very clear publicly. Mm-hmm. If you didn't want to play, don't get on the bus. Go on home for Christmas because you were there to win the game. And that was clear mentality that you bred across everybody in the program, privately and publicly. Well, again, everyone had different things to play for. Number one, we're playing for the University of Tennessee, number one. Number two, if you were a senior, this was your last opportunity to put on a show for – the NFL, if you're an underclassman thinking of potentially leaving and going to the league, um, this is your last opportunity. And then a lot of us, you know, as I said before, we only had, what, 12 or um, how many games back then, 13 games, uh, opportunities for form on a national stage. So, yes, we were pretty, excuse my language, pissed off by the way we, we, you know, performed at the LSU game, but that was on us. And the only thing for us to, I guess, feel better about ourselves or, or so-called redeem ourselves was to go out and, you know, take it out on Michigan. Michigan shouldn't have been on the field with us that, that day. We knew the time team that we were. But if we didn't show up and we kind of went out there and didn't want to be there, they probably would have beat us. So I was really proud of the team, the way that we not only bounced back, but the way we practiced and performed. And um, you know, had a great, uh, I guess, showing um, down there in uh, Cedars Bowl. Well, it was a, a great run, great career for you at the University of Tennessee. A lot of big-time wins, not just at Florida, but – uh, you brought so many great things to the table at Tennessee, so much swagger and confidence with the position and, and, and carried that across your teammates. We appreciate you taking some time out to join us here on our Rocky Top Rewind on the Blue Water uh, Climate Control Volquest.com podcast. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it, man.